Hello world, I'm just here to make you think. Sorry. Today we're going to talk about one of Philadelphia's North Philly's legends. The late Noonie Mims. Now, a lot of people might ask me, how did you know him if he was before your time? Well, I'm about to take y'all down memory lane to break all this down to you. First of all, Noonie Mims is from my neighborhood. You know, my late uncle Smiley and Noonie Mims was like brothers. Noonie Mims' brother, Jeff Mims, may he rest in peace. That's an old friend of my mother's. When Noonie Mims, before he went to prison and all that, and he was in, you know, always in our house, always around my family, because like I told you, him and my uncle was like brothers. In the nation of Islam together, the black mafia together, they was really family. And he had a sister. And his sister and my mother was girlfriends, same neighborhood, 10th Street. When I went to junior high school, John Wanamaker's, one of my girlfriends at that time was Noonie Mims' niece, Sharita Mims. And I always showed her the utmost respect, even though I used to flirt with a lot of females back then and all that. I always showed her respect because I knew her bloodline. I knew she was family anyway because I had respect for her mother because her mother and my mother was girlfriends. My mom used to sell dinners and my mom used to always go see her. So, and plus my mom really knows Sharita, like, you know, since she was a baby. You know what I mean? We graduated together and all that. But when Jeff Mims' brother came home, I mean, excuse me, when, yeah, when Jeff, when Jeff came home, Nooney Mims' brother came home, I think it was 86 he came home. We was living on top of the bar in 12th and Dolphin. He was in the halfway house on Cecil B. Moore. I think it was uh, 15th or 17th and Cecil B. Moore, just when it was called Columbia Avenue. And me and my mom used to walk him back to the halfway house. Yeah, I mean, she, they'd be up there talking, he'd be drinking beer, getting drunk, and he'd just run all the back in the day stories down to my mom about how things was back in the day. You know, he was the first one, Jeff Mann was the first one that put me and my twin brother in the, in, the, in the game, not in the game, but we was like about to be on Franklin and Hustling, excuse me, on Franklin and Huntington Hustling. But Jeff Mims, you know, when he's alive, he gave Mikey a 16th, some small shit. And I had enough to buy me an ounce of weed, you know, because he already knew we young boys, 13, we in the streets, but we in the street streets. You know, he already know who we are. He knows since we, we knew ourselves. He knows, you know what I'm saying? He already know the bloodline we come from. So, you know, 
I you know, mean, see, Jeff Mims, he turned the 11 and a half, 23 county bid in the 20 years for stabbing somebody in the chest, killing them. Like, these dudes were seven foot. Jeff Mims and Nooney Mims, they was giants, man. Like, and they had real big ass hands. They smack you, they knock you out, man. Because when I had the incident in John Wanamaker's junior high school, Jeff Mims came up there. You know what I mean? I brought him up there because the boy Hezekiah had his uncle and his aunt and all them. They had weapons. So when got main man, he came up there, had the principal scared to death when he seen this giant walk in the office and about me and my situation. You know what I'm saying? Oh, you should deal with it? Okay. Yeah, that was my uh that was my uh, one of my childhood girlfriends. Man, I had all the girlfriends and and um and winemakers, and she was one of them. But you know, I kept it respectable. Yeah, you know I mean. Anyway, she never used to take me serious though, because she knew how females was. Females, all of them liked me in the school, and being so she probably used to see me flirt with other girls, so she never took me serious. But you know, it is what it is. But anyway, when Nuni Mims got locked up for the Dubrawl case. Yeah, I mean, that was a political situation that he found himself in because it was still a lot of racism going on in our country, heavy. So, you know what I mean? When they locked him up, they put all type of dirt in the case. The media fabricated and made up a lot of bullshit. So, you know, he had to spend the rest of his life in prison, but while he was in prison, right? He ran the whole greatest for. You know, he, he had somebody bringing him his own food. He had to go down to child hall. You know what I mean, he had, to, he had his own key to, like, he could really get in and out of his cell when he wanted to get in and out of his cell. He had people come from the streets, anybody he wanted to come in that jail to visit him. You know what I'm saying? And you used to get a lot of visits from real people, man. Like real people is in the streets doing their thing. Yeah, you know I mean, and he like if they somebody had a problem in jail, like because of the respect they had for the black mafia and the nation of Islam, it wasn't hard for him to control any jail he was at. You know, one time a guy from Dallas. State penitentiary came and graded for it just to talk to Nooney Mims to ask Nooney Mims how to run a penitentiary. He asked him for advice. How do he start up a prison? You know, and when Jeff came home, when I got a chance to meet him, right? This one I was really like when I came on, I met him when I was a young boy. But he came home again. He came home. I, he was home like in 94. I used to go see him up on Honer Street up Mount Airy, around the corner from King High School. You know what I mean? I always kept in touch with him. You know what I mean? When I was out there rolling around because he still was my old head. You know what I mean? Plus, I still respected Black Mafia, JB. I still respected those rules and codes and shit. So, you know I mean? I respected that life. You know, and Jeff, he was like, he was a beast, man. Like, he could fight. He was a giant. You know what I mean? And those brothers back in the day, like from my neighborhood, they from the gang war days. You know what I mean? So they took it how it came. They ain't cry about being in jail, none of that shit, man. Them boys is like, like that shit ain't mean nothing to them. It was just life, like a part of life to them. They ain't cried, none of that shit, you know, so the respect that he had, you know, like, respect he had in jail from other people, like, he had respect from people who didn't even, who didn't even know him. Like, people feared him that was, people were scared to go to jail because they were scared they had to run to him and they thought he was going to extort him and all that because he had that type of reputation. That dudes is coming from the streets, coming to see him, breaking him. That's why Shams Dean had it so easy in Philly when he was in the Mass J out West Philly because 
because of that power behind that name. You feel what I'm saying? You know, when they kicked him out of greatest for it, that was crazy because before they kicked him out of greatest for it, right? The riot at Cold Township 95, they had let a board by the name of Mud Man. He got out of jail, right? He had life. Somehow he made up paperwork or paid somebody to hook up some parole papers. He got out. When he got out, he killed the state trooper. And when he killed the state trooper, they changed the rules and regulations about parole. Because before this happened, people was making parole like this. Everybody was making parole. But when he got killed, I mean, when he killed the cop and went to jail, they had to change all the rules and regulations dealing with parole. They was making people do 85% of their time and get to complete all these programs. And then when he got locked up and they put him on death row in Jersey, he wound up dead from the hands of another inmate on death row. Now, mind you, I was in a hole before in Greatest Port, right? And we in a hole is connected to death row. Like, I go in the yard. And you could be right in another cage. They call it his yard, but they got you in a big ass cage, fence cage. And you could be right next to the next, right next to somebody from death row, even on a visit. But you gotta have permission. When they put two inmates together on death row to play basketball, I've seen that before. They had two inmates and they play basketball against each other. So when Mudman got killed, they he had to have permission to get in that cell. He white. They don't have white and black inmates together like that. So how he got knocked off is still up in the air. You know what I'm saying? Because he killed a state trooper in Jersey, I think. So when he sent, went to jail and another inmate killed him, it was like swept under the rug because he killed the state trooper. That's a no-brainer how he got killed. Anyway, like when that happened, they, when that riot happened at Cold Township, they had came in with all these special, the special type of security and shook the whole great, the whole Cold Township down in August, right? August 15th, 16th. Well, that riot was over the same day. Anyway, they came in there, vandalized all of us. And like October, November, they went the greatest for it and did a whole sweep. In that greater world, they had everybody was doing good, living good and all that. They came in there, they found pounds of weed in the jail, knives, weapons, everything. But guess where they found the pounds at? They found the pounds of weed in the hole. It's like three or four holes in greatest four. L block, J block, and K block. And then you had the back of E block was the hole. So you had a lot of holes, you know what I mean? But greatest for it was like the streets because you had so many people that worked there that was getting paid to bring all type of shit. And so it was like, you know, the streets for real, like people all around with real money and everything. So when they came in there and shook the jail down, they transferred Nooney Mims out Minnesota. You know, so once he left the jail, Greatest Fool was still doing a little something, something. But it wasn't the same when he was there. You know what I'm saying? And he wound up having diabetes and they took one leg off. Then he died of diabetes. But it's like he was not only a strong man, but this brother, he made sure the Muslims in Greatest Ford had anything they needed. He was the E-man of greatest for. You know what I mean? I'm going to let y'all see this picture again. See, that's him in the middle. Jeff Gant with the white shirt on. And my cousin Askia with the blue and white shirt on. This is a real powerful picture right here. You know what I mean? And this other picture is, is him, Nooney Mims, by himself. The older version of him. 
You know what I mean? Like one man from North Philly has so much power and control over the minds of many strong black men. Not only that, he was top, he was one of Elijah Muhammad's bodyguards at one time. He used to have Malcolm X around him. When Malcolm X came to Philly, his security was Nooney Mims, Uncle Smiley, and all of them. When Muhammad Ali came to Philly, um, Nooney Mim, Shamsuddin, all of them used to, uh, you know what I mean? They used to uh, bodyguard him when he came to Philly. Go picture right here. Nooney Mims, Muhammad Ali in the middle, and Shamsuddin. Powerful picture right here, man. Like, this is why Philadelphia Black Mafia was so powerful, man. Like, not just because they were strong and it hurt you, they were some intelligent men. And a lot of them is still out here, they older now, but I know a lot of them watch my videos, so I had to give them a treat. And throw Nooney Mims up there so they can see one of the old comrades, you know. Salute to the Black Mafia. Salute to all the brothers that's still out here moving around, that's just out here living their life. Salute to Jeff Mims. May he rest in peace. Salute to Mocha Smiley. May he rest in peace. Salute to Nooney Mims. May he rest in peace, man. You know what I mean? Strong Black man right there, man. But the Mud Man, I know y'all remember this. The white guy that had life, I think he was in there for killing the judge or something. He's in there for doing something crazy. But he got out of jail, man. And when he got caught, he just, just got out of jail and chilled. He got out of jail and, and killed a state trooper, man. And that made it hard for a lot of us getting out of jail. You know what I mean? To change greatest for it, man. All type of stuff that was privileged to blacks back then was taken. When you know what I mean, when Bud Man did this thing and that riot happened to Cold Township. Exactly. They moved him across because they knew that Philadelphia had real strong men. They didn't know about the black mafia until 10 years after they existed. You know what I mean? They was that quiet that secretive and that feared and respected because they learn how to do for self. You see, back then, those brothers, the strong men that we had back in the 60s, Philadelphia, Nooney Mills being one of them, Old Smiley being one of them, Sam Christian being one of them, they got together, man. And all these gangs they had, they had real gangs, man. The gangs they had in the 60s, We'll wipe all these little that's out here now. They run right through this little situation they doing out here in the streets in the world right now. They, they was they run through gangs. They run through little cliques that you got right now. But Nooney Mims and his team of brothers got together and got all the gangs around Philadelphia on school buses and taught them to do for self. They became the nation of Islam in Philadelphia. Myers number 12, Sister Claire Muhammad. 13 for Susquehanna. 12 for South. And all that dumb shit stopped. Now, it's a lot of still brothers with that mindset out here. And there's a lot of offspring with that mindset out here like me. We need to come together, man. We come together, y'all. Exactly. Yeah, you know I mean, and another thing, y'all, like we can we just we can do the same thing again. We can talk to the brothers, man. Like y'all understand these young brothers, man, like they our kids. How are we gonna let our kids, our offspring, our own youth from our city 
get out of pocket the way they out of pocket. Like we got to talk to them, man. We got to sit them down and school them and give them some games so they won't be out here fucking their life up, going to the penitentiary, killing each other. It's like it's young as out here. They don't got no respect to the point that they kill a dad, homie, son. They won't give a fuck about it. Like this, this shit got to stop because we got to talk to them. We got to let them know the history. We got to show them old movies and videos and, and tell them old stories so they can understand. Because them the way they follow Chicago, that shit hurting me, man, because we bigger than following the other city. We the strongest city <clears throat> other than New York. You know what I mean? And L.A. Crips and Bloods on some real shit. Like, Philly hold it down heavy. You understand what I'm saying? So we got to help change the narrative by talking to the youth like Nooney Mims and them did. Seriously, man, because I don't know how y'all may feel, but 200 years from now, when I'm not here no more, and our race is all fucked up because we didn't do nothing about it right now, we trying to make sure the generations that's coming after us, after we gone, they be all right. You know what I'm saying? Because I don't want them out here following no knucklehead shit. This is why we got to talk to the youth, man, because it ain't what you do, it's how you do it. You understand what I'm saying? So that's the story I got for y'all on the famous Nooney Mims. May he rest in peace. Sponsored by the Big Fella Philly Food Truck on Adams Avenue and Whitaker Avenue. That's the Big Fella Philly Food Truck. Well, Adams Avenue and Whitaker Avenue, also Showtime Promotions. Showtime Promotions, they always do the shows at Lou and Choose once a month. So look up S-H-O-T-Y-M-E, Showtime Promotions, and have them book a show, a party, whatever, so you can have a good time with the 80s and 90s old school music, hip-hop. Feel me? I don't know even, man. I don't know why he ain't leave either, man. Like, see, my thing is this, man. I wouldn't, I, me personally, I'm not standing there. I'm not doing all that time, bro. If I'm that intelligent with that much power, man, I'm out, man. Shoot the boy New York did. They ain't find him yet. That big drug dealer from back in the day. I think he was working with them folks, though, man. I don't give a fuck what nobody say. He was connected. That's why they can't find him. I don't care what nobody say. You know what I mean? Like, we feel it, y'all. We got to represent to the fullest, man. We got to, like, this is our history, y'all. Like, like, I'm proud of the 80s and 90s Philly, man. I really am, man, no matter how it turned out or whatever. But they was two best eras for a lot of people, man. You know, and we can't forget that. You know what I'm saying? Shout out to Philly, shout out to New York, shout out to Canada, shout out to the UK. You know what I mean? Shout out to Germany. You know what I mean? I got other countries following me now, y'all watching this now. We getting there. I want to let y'all know something, y'all. I didn't have over 1.4 million people watch my videos since I've been doing this thing. You know, my computer tells me everything, man. And this month alone, 22,000 people watched the channel. That's good. But overall, 1.4 million watched my videos. And we're growing, y'all. We're growing. We're growing. I'm proud of that, man. Thank y'all for your support. I'm almost at 300,000 views. Moving close to 2,300 subscribers. At first, I thought it was about to having a lot of subscribers, but once you get a thousand subscribers, that's when you can start making money, right? So it's really about the views. And I get so many views every day. It ain't about how many subscribers you got. It's about how many views you get. <laughs> you know what I mean? And my views on the beam. You know what I mean? Seriously, every day, like 5,000 to 5, 5,500 people 
come in. I appreciate the love. I appreciate the respect. I'm keep coming with these videos for y'all. Yeah, I'm going to keep letting y'all reminisce, bring up the past to y'all, you know. And another thing, these messages and these stories, I'm glad a lot of the youngins is watching it, man. I got a lot of youngins that watch this channel, females and males from age 18 to 35. And from 36 to 75, I got love too. But that young crowd, I got them. I'm glad of that because they, they get it. Yeah, you know I mean, they're getting a message too. They understand that they're not going to look the same or act the same five, ten years from now. Yeah, you know I mean, they a lot of young think they always going to be and feel the same way. They don't know as they get older, their brain continues to develop, and then they stay in a that in that pace of being stay ways. They don't right now. They just experiment with shit. They get older, they're going to settle down. A lot of them don't know it because I didn't know it. You got you have to live a long time to understand. It. A lot of people don't live long. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, Frank. Yeah, Frank. Yeah, I really believe Frank. Cause you gotta understand something, man. Like. He had the Frank connection. He was getting all that money, right? I understand people can hide you, right? But you understand something. You got powerful people that can find you, man. And I really believe he was working with them folks. Think about it. Y'all seen Snowfall, how the boy Franklin was working with them folks? This is how they work with them folks, too, because they had to fight third world countries to help fund and make that money. What do you think all that money was going through? All that money was making in the hood. That shit was, that was getting shipped out. That shit was funding other country wars. That's how I know that this boy, he helped, he helped bring in too much money for them to just lock him up, man. I mean, it's possible that he could hide, but come on, we're being realistic here. He had to work with them people. What do think? They do get worse every time. Each generation do get worse. Exactly. When Mudman did that, man, when he did that, right, they killed that man. You know they lined him up, killed him in the library, little John. But when he did that, they wanted to do that to us anyway. They always find a way to try to put the clamps on this man. You ever notice that they were to a certain type of crime happen, then they change the law that makes us suffer. You see what I'm saying? We had to suffer, man. There's a reason why they put blocks in front of us through history, right? The Kwame Browns, the, the uh, Hurricane Carter, and this other boy that was in there with Hurricane Carter this boxer, they wouldn't even give him the belt. He was beating dudes down. His name is, I'm going to tell you this boy, name. this boy wasn't no joke, man. See, they was, they targeted him. They didn't want the WBC belt to go to this boy because they said because he was locked up and all that old crazy shit. See, every time somebody black is powerful and they can do something good in sports, they make it with though. It takes something from you. See, when they did the Kwame Brown, the basketball player, they made him look like a bum and all that because they didn't want no other kids coming out of high school that was of color to go into the NBA and become millionaires. And he was the poster child for all the young boys to follow his lead, to go from high school to pro, to get their mom out the ghetto. So they started all this bullshit about this man so nobody can come out of high school and feed their family. That's all that was about point blank bottom line and the young boy they did that too far as like when he was locked up and they did all that they, they did him dirty that was this boy right here man i'm gonna show you this boy man this video that i sent my folks man i think it's his first one right here now this video right here right uh, this boy his name is um if this is the one this might be it i'm gonna show y'all it's his brother he's from jersey Yep. 
His name was James Scott. The James Scott documentary. This boy right here, I want y'all to look up the James Scott documentary, right? He was a hell of a boxer, man. Him right here. It's a story of one man's desperate battle to keep from being known. When I tell you pound for pound, he could beat anybody they put in front of him. I'm talking about this boy used to hit. He used to hit like a mule, a Georgia mule. I mean, he used to hit so hard, he could knock a Georgia mule out. Look him up, y'all. His name James Scott. Look him up, y'all, on YouTube. Watch his video. Trust me. Y'all going to be happy I put y'all down with this boy, man. He wasn't no joke with the hands, man. He was a beast. Look him up. James Scott on YouTube. The James Scott documentary. Hurricane Carter. A lot of people couldn't even like do three rounds of Hurricane Carter. He went three rounds of Hurricane Carter. He, he way more than Hurricane Carter. This boy wasn't no joke. When y'all look up his fights, man, y'all going to see this boy throwing blows like George Foreman. He was throwing blows like George Foreman, bro. Watch when y'all watch it, man. This is the reason why our youngest got to learn, man, and start reading up on things. And YouTube is the perfect platform to watch anything about information that you want to know. Type it in on YouTube, and they're going to sh show you everything. And James Scott is a must-watch, if y'all heard about it. All right, y'all. Make sure y'all go watch James Scott. Peace.